Okay, welcome to the second lecture for uh, American Government at Ohlone College. Um, this lecture is on, as you see, what is political science? We looked at science last time, now we're going to look at political science. First, we need to think about what is politics a little bit. Uh, two definitions here of what is politics. First, collective action and collective decision making regarding fundamental values and distribution of resources. Second, who gets what, when, and how? That's Laswell. It's a very famous definition. He was a great American political scientist. Um, you know, fundamentally, politics is about power, about the right to do things, the right to make decisions, who can you tell to do things, and who can you not tell to do things. So power is an incredibly important part of political life. And politics in general is a very important part of social life, at least and perhaps more important than the economy, family, or church. So what kinds of things count as political behavior? Uh, how people vote, that's political behavior. Things politicians advocate for or publicly support. Why do some politicians support fracking and why are some anti-fracking? Well, we need an explanation for that. Uh, how people adopt their political ideas. How, how did you come to have the set of political opinions that you have? How many parties are in democratic governments? This varies a lot. Uh, how and why some countries are democratic and some are authoritarian? Really important question, right? Having answers to that seems like a pretty good idea. Why do wars start? These are all important questions in political science. We're not going to get too deep. We're only, you know, we're, we're looking at two, our main theories here, okay? But anything that intersects with government can be political behavior. Um, I'll, be, I'll be focusing on two kinds of political behavior in this lecture. Uh, first, what are called institutionalists or institutionalism. And secondly, political sociology, which looks at culture. So institutionalists or institutionalism looks at the rules of uh, the rules of politics, okay? Things like the veto, the filibuster, the electoral college, which I'll be talking about today, that looks at the rules of politics. Uh, political sociologists look at culture and how does culture matter in explaining uh, how people behave. So our first theory family, what I've titled institutionalism, this is what most people call it, sometimes known as rational actor approaches. But let's talk about what is an institution. An institution is a government, a business, or a church when looked at from the point of view of the rules that allow that institution to function through time, especially through changes in leadership and personnel. The United Nations, Ford Motor Company, and the city government of Los Angeles are all institutions. But they all also have different, role, different rules as far as who gets to do what and when, which obviously affects who gets what, where, and how. Political scientists use institutional theories to appeal to the rules to explain political behavior. So let's look at some the sort of origin and way these institutionalist theories tend to work. First, the origin of most institutional analysis comes from microeconomics, uh, such as social choice theory, public choice theory, game theory, veto player analysis, okay? Um, if you don't know that, you know, if you don't know what those things are, it doesn't matter. Just keep in mind, this is, you know, political scientists are borrowing these kinds of methods from uh, economists who uh, started, who developed them about starting about 50, 60 years ago. The goal of institutional kinds of analysis is to explain political behavior. That's the same for all scientists. And the basic insight is that uh, people are trying to get the best bang for their buck. This is what an economist calls profit maximization or just maximizing behavior. In political science, we call it policy maximization. To express this insight, institutionalists argue that rules determine outcomes or rules affect behavior. Rules matter is what they say. So uh, let's look at this. Uh, institutionalists look at the rules as causing behavior. The rule is the cause and the behavior is the effect. Let's take an example. One of the rules we have in the United States is called the Electoral College. 
The Electoral College is how we vote for president. But what's different about the Electoral College is we don't just throw all the votes in a pile and see who has the most. Rather, we vote on a state-by-state -state basis. And if you win that state, you get all the votes from that state. Okay, so um, that's, a, that's what we call a winner-take-all approach to voting, right? You win California by one vote, you get all the votes in California. You win Michigan or Wisconsin by 10,000 votes, you get all of their electors, okay? Um, now, what that does is it creates a system of swing states and safe states. Swing states are states that are going to be close, that we're pretty confident are going to be close, and could go either way, could vote either Democratic or Republican. Safe states are all the other states, right? California, Texas, New York, etc. Everybody knows who's going to win in these states, and no one pays attention. So this is the map. This is a map from four years ago. It's from that article I put up there. So the new map is a little bit different. For example, especially up here in the top, there's my cursor. Up here, you know, this map has these as safe states, but Pennsylvania is traditionally considered a swing state. So I just disagree with the authors of this particular piece on that one. And then Michigan and Wisconsin, uh, uh, sorry, Michigan and Wisconsin, uh, no, Michigan, Wisconsin, that's Minnesota. Michigan and Wisconsin have uh, been swings, been much closer for a while. But anyways, and it's unclear if Colorado is still a swing state. It looks like Colorado is becoming pretty reliably Democratic. Um, but this is your basic breakdown. If it's blue, it's pretty reliably Democratic. If it's red, it's reliably Republican. And if it's gray, it's a swing state. So how do rules matter? Well, one, sometimes you have more votes, but you have them in the wrong places, and then you lose. Sorry, Al Gore. Sorry, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> uh, you know, it happens if you vote in this manner, it creates the possibility for someone to have fewer votes, but still to win the election because of the Electoral College. Um, but there's a second effect here, which is very, very important. Because politicians know what the swing and safe states are, they spend a lot more of their time in the swing in swing states. So let's look at the next map. This is, this is again, this is Obama-Romney in 2012, but uh, I've seen similar visualizations for uh, Clinton and Trump. And, you know, where did they go? Well, these are basically all swing states, right? And if you see here on this map, as should probably be indicated, here is um, Wisconsin, and that is a swing state. 18 visits to Wisconsin, 73 to Ohio, 5 to Pennsylvania, uh, that's New Hampshire, Colorado, Nevada, Florida. I mean, look at this, Virginia, Iowa. I mean, this is where Clinton and, uh, sorry, uh, Obama and Romney spent their time, okay? Now, Presidential candidates will go other places. They'll go to California. They'll go to Texas, but they go there just to raise money. If you notice here, what's this? Where, where presidential and vice presidential candidates held public campaign events. These are rallies, okay? Where did you go to rally for votes? You might go to California, raise money. You go to Texas, raise money. Even if you're a Democrat, you go to Texas, raise money. Republicans raise money in California all the time. But for public campaign events, they are going to swing states. So what does that do? Boy, that explains a whole lot of behavior. Wow. I have a theory. Politicians are going to behave a certain way, try to maximize their, their, uh, their, their victory, their winning. And then two, I have evidence for it. Here we go. Got to come this way. Two, I have evidence for it. I just simply go out here. And this is a basic statistical method. I just counted. Wow, I just counted where did they go, and this is what it showed me, or in this case, what it showed the authors of the article. That's a strong effect on how people behave. Our second theory family is what we call political sociology. And political sociology is, um, looks at science a little bit differently. Um, the origin comes from the field of sociology itself. And sociology is concerned with studying how people form their ideas and opinions. So it's not whether those opinions are right or wrong. 
simply speaking, you know, what are the processes by which people come to have political ideas? What explains how they, um, we call it socialization, how they become politically socialized. The goal of political sociology is to explain political behavior. And the insight is that culture matters, right? Rules definitely matter, but boy, culture matters as well. So in this case, culture is the cause and the behavior, you'll see it in a second, is the effect, okay? Political sociologists focus on how people adopt their political ideas and feelings. There we go, fix that. See, that's nice for you guys now, okay? So culture is the cause, behavior is the effect. Political sociologists focus on how people come up with their ideas and feelings. A basic view of culture incorporates three elements, ideas, feelings, and practices. So where institutionalists appeal to rules to explain behavior, culturalists appeal to what people want, think, and value, and they use ideas, feelings, and values as part of their explanation, right? So let's take an example. Um, many of my students uh, who take this class usually full-time in the in-class version uh, come from the Indian subcontinent where Hinduism is the largest religion, okay? Hinduism, interestingly, has an idea that all living things are connected together and therefore deserving of respect. Many of these students, more frequently than students of other religions, uh, want to do research projects on the ethical treatment of animals. And this even includes people who are only, they're from India, but they don't practice Hinduism. You know what I mean? It's like your parents go to church, but who, come on, you don't have time for that, right? Even then, this kind of idea that all living things are connected together still has this kind of important, it's not like it just because you don't practice Hinduism, the idea completely goes away. They're still motivated by it, and they want to do research projects on ethical treatment of animals. It's a really good research project, actually, so I always let them do it. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, they've internalized this Hindu idea, and they're motivated a certain way to act from it. Lots of other ideas can be used to explain behavior. Justice, freedom, capitalism, these can all be very motivating. Uh, so I have, uh, for example, Americans, um, we tend to view freedom as more economic and less political. So we don't like regulating the economy as much. Lots of other places don't have that same view of freedom. They don't mind regulating the econ economy. They don't view it as in any sense threatening to freedom. Um, so secondly, we want to look at feelings, okay? And you might be thinking to yourself, well, what do feelings have to do with politics? And the answer is everything. For example, George Bush was off, often criticized for embracing a politics of fear, whereas Obama was often criticized for raising hopes too high, so high that he couldn't delir, deliver on his promises. Fear and hope can be very strong motivators of behavior. Other emotions matter too. Envy, shame, superiority, etc. Now, what practices are, practices are things like debates, talking to your neighbor about politics, things you actually do, okay? So patriotism is learned and spread through practices like the Pledge of Allegiance, voting, even watching TV, you pick up on these kinds of things, okay? And these practices, I pledge allegiance to the flag, you say it, you practice it, and then it comes to be a feeling that you actually have. So. Uh, for political sociologists, they tend to think the ideas and the feelings come after the practices. A political example could be segregation. Segregation was a practice enshrined in law that said whites and blacks had to use separate facilities, and when shared, blacks had to sit in the back or stand, you know, all this kind of stuff. Big surprise, these practices created some feelings of superiority with whites and inferiority amongst blacks then you have racism and you can explain why people are opposed to integration because they have adopted these feelings, these racist feelings that whites and blacks should be separate. Now let's return briefly to the Electoral College. Um, the rules people can't explain everything going on in the Electoral College, specifically what we call partisan polarization, which means simply that Republicans are becoming Republican and Dems more Dem. So like, look at this chart. We have this decrease in number of swing states. The rules don't explain that. We need a cultural explanation to say, 
why are states sorting themselves more and more and more into one different party? The end. Haha. <laughs>